All right. So just to say that again, uh, there's something for everybody in this talk, I hope, as you can see from the various words in the title. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that I do is, is right at the intersection of science and art. And I hope to show you some of the examples in which I try to combine the two. Um, one that respects deeply the science and the way that the universe works. And the other that also uh, pays attention to the, our subjective experience and our emotions behind the reaction that we have when we see how the universe works. Um, this is a very important statement, and the reason why art and science make such a great mixture is because they are neither in, inhuman nor ridiculous, and out of the two, I hope you know which one is worse. <clears throat> so one of the things that I do is covers, covers for journals um, of colleagues or of, of my own papers that describe in some graphical way uh, the science. Uh, for example, this cover, uh, you know, how, how did I come up with this cover? This cover was motivated by this art piece, uh, which is just a mobile of paper birds. So you can draw inspiration from all sorts of uh, artistic uh, expression of other people, uh, geometries, um, and things that you see in space, such as birds in the sky, to, to create something that is data-driven um, for the purpose of communicating science. So to show you uh, an example of kind of how this works, Typically what happens is people send me some data and they say that they want to get a cover made. And so I say, well, send me your data, and they send me this. Uh, this is un unambiguously a lot of data, but it isn't something that you can necessarily turn into art uh, because there's nothing really here uh, that, that, that is uh, attractive or really visually interesting from an artistic point of view. So you know, I would say, well, is there anything else that you have that you can send me? So, you know, this, this group sent me this, and I realized, you know, if I had used that for a cover, it would wind up looking like this. Uh, so I don't think I, I want to do that. So it actually, you know, if you think that that's funny, there are, there are journal covers that look absolutely hideous of really good science, but really bad art direction. And that, that, is, that is everywhere. Um, and, and I hope that you can do what you can to fight against this kind of... Uh, uh, incongruity between really good science and really bad art. But they did eventually wind up sending me some microscopy slides, which the first one I saw was fantastic. You know, you can, you can really kind of jump into this image uh, almost as if you are traveling in space. Uh, I hope you see a face there. Uh, the, more, the, more out, the more blurry these images were, the more out of focus they were, the more exciting they were to look at. Um, I saw this one and I thought, oh, that looks cool. That looks just like that. Um, so, you know, you're kind of getting expired. And then this image immediately made me think of a Star Trek episode, The Doomsday Machine, if you maybe had a chance to watch it. And so I thought that that's the image that I would use for, for the cover. So taking elements from all of those microscopy slides, starting with these cells that kind of make things look like space. Can we turn the lights down a bit? It's impossible to see that. Yeah, great, thanks. Let's just keep them off. Um, you know, this is, this is kind of the beginning of space. Space is always on fire. So all of these elements are taken from other microscopy slides. And then you insert that element in there. And if you ask yourself, well, what is that? That is a cross section of a mouse vein. And the reason why it's glowing is because the proteins in that mouse vein are fluorescing under a, a stimulation by light. And so what you're really looking at is protein expression in mouse veins. And then you add the journal title, and there it is. So I managed to make biology look like space, which was always a dream of mine, because I never wanted to be a biologist. I always wanted to be a physicist. A um, couple of examples of what to do, what, what to think about doing when you are creating communication of any kind. Uh, this is incredibly important. And if you, if, you, if you ever mislead, you're a very bad person, and you should immediately stop doing what you're doing and quit your job. Um, you have to realize that most conversations are for the purpose of entertainment. So don't try to over-educate people when the time is not right. Getting this balance right is really, really hard. What happens when this balance goes wrong? Okay. I'm sure you've seen this movie. Yes? Uh, okay. Right? Dinosaurs. So you go to the website of this movie, and uh, there's this creation lab, and they tell you how to grow a dinosaur. This is great. So the first thing you do is, you know, you extract the DNA, and there's a happy 
Mr. DNA down there telling you that he's having a good time. Uh, you sequence the DNA. Now, let's say you're in communication and you have the job to communicate to the public what genomic sequencing looks like. What, what is wrong with this picture? This man is staring at a computer CPU. That, that piece that he's holding in his hand has nothing to do with how sequencing is actually done. First lie. Why would they do that? I'll leave you to answer that for yourself. What should he be holding? He should be holding one of these things, which is a flow cell, which is a tiny little channels where the DNA is embedded and in, inserted into the machine. And he's, hold, and, and he's cleaning it because he make sure it's clean. All right, so then they tell you that you're going to assemble the genome, right? So they have some visualization, and then there's a dinosaur outline, a triceratops, to make sure that you understand that that's a dinosaur genome. We'll get to that very soon. Then you put the genome in an egg, and then you uh, hope that the right thing comes out when you make this dinosaur. Unfortunately, something went wrong along the lines of the process. There was, there was a lie that you didn't see. Right? So there was a giant lie that you didn't spot because the people who made that assume you didn't know any better. And so you get this. Why did you get that? That's because when you saw that image, that is not the dinosaur genome, obviously, because there's no such thing as dinosaurs right now. That is taken from the paper of corn. That is a corn genome. So, uh, and I know this because that's the software I made to make that. So they have, they have misled you. They have taken an, lost an opportunity to, to choose the right genome or to make some statement about dinosaur genomics or lizard genomics or chicken genomics, which are the modern dinosaurs. Uh, and just took the next best thing that kind of looks like it. Who cares? So, of course, they are going to be open to ridicule. And I will ridicule you. If I find you doing this, I will mock you in public. So, game on. When you describe and explain things to people, you sometimes want to say, well, it's kind of like this other thing, right? Because you kind of understand this other thing. And so this thing is like this other thing. So now I think I explained it to you. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't work, and you think that it's a good explanation, but the explanation is so broken that you don't realize how broken it is. So, has anybody seen this question posed? Have you seen this? Yes? So why would somebody ask this question? You have to ask yourself, well, that's a ridiculous question, you know, get, it, get out of the room. But no, 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 I'm not going to be that way. I'm going to say, why did they ask this question? What, to, what could they have seen that made them think that this is a reasonable question? This. If you saw this and you thought this is what evolution looked like, that is a perfectly legitimate question, right? There's no more monkeys. Are we, humans came out of monkeys. There's still monkeys around. In fact, if you, at the time that I made this, when you typed in evolution, that's what you got in Google Images. There was nothing that was faintly related to anything about evolution. In fact, you have to scroll down past the monkey to get to a tree. This is a beautiful image. And this is the tree of life. And this uh, gives you the sense of speciation, also gives you maybe the sense of extinction, and, and it, it captures the aspects of evolution that are completely missing in the graphical meme joke. What can happen is then you generate um, images that are meant to represent real science, and they're confused with fake science. Now, you may be sitting too far away to recognize which of these is real science and which of these is fake science. It's hard to tell, right? In fact, which one has, seems to have more information in it that you can read and get? The one on the left. I like the one on the left. Lots of stuff going on. There's colors. There's shapes. It must mean something doesn't mean anything. It's an astrological chart between the compatibility of Prince Charles and Camilla. Right? It's, it's complete, utter garbage. The stuff on the right is gene expression. It's complete and utter science. And yet, if you look at this bottom shape here, it looks like a cow knitting. You know? I, I, I don't know anything about what am I supposed to get from that. That's sad. You may have seen this metaphor, genomics, the big blueprint, or the blueprint, the, the code of life. Okay, that is the worst explanation of what a genome is. And in fact, if you thought you understood more about the genome when you saw the word blueprint, you should be told that you now are dumber. You understand less. Why? Because this is a blueprint. And this is a genome. And one of the things that it makes it very difficult to, 
in genomics and, and, and to study organisms from their DNA is you do not know what the organism looks like. If I give you a genome, what, what is the genome? What is the animal? No? Yeah? You couldn't tell me. You, you, the only way you would know what animal that is is you would align it to the genome of other animals and go, well, it's kind of close to this animal, so it must be similar to that animal. But you couldn't work out the shape of this animal. It's the dog. So this image actually tells you more about aspects of the dog than the genome does. To, to get the fact that the sausage dog is long and has short legs, impossible to get that out of the genome. And yet, just out of a picture. So you can draw some data about the dog genome and the human genome, and yet it, this drawing with a single stroke of the pen tells you more about the dog's personality than the genome ever will, which means that this is still important and it's still relevant. That is uh, the dog that Picasso drew. Um, his name was Lump, and, and you can here see that he is, doesn't have good table manners. So what is a genome? Right? I just told you that the blueprint is a really bad metaphor for a genome. So what is the right metaphor? There is no metaphor for the genome because there's nothing out there that acts like a genome. But this is the, pretty much the closest thing that you can get to a genome. So if you have a house, right? everybody lives somewhere. This is your house's genome. What is this? It's a bunch of tools used to make the house. What is not in here? The workers, the people who use the tools, and the material the house is made out of. It's not in the genome. The fact that we digest glucose for food, one of the things that we can digest for food, it, that's not in the genome. Only the enzymes and the chemicals that act on glucose are in the genome. What makes studying disease through genomes very difficult is that when you get to another genome, your neighbor's home genome, and their neighbor's home is broken and it's falling apart and you're trying to figure out why. What are the differences? Did you notice? I'll flip back and forth. Did you, are you see that now? Okay. What are the consequences of having this ruler crooked when it comes to making a home? I don't know. Maybe they don't even use this ruler when you make a home. Maybe that's just there because it, somebody left it in the big pile of tools and it's not being used anymore, so it doesn't matter. Maybe this other level is, can make up for the, for the problem with the ruler, or maybe the house dies immediately. You just don't know. This is what makes studying things like cancer through genomics actually really quite challenging. So who has good explanations? Who, who can you go to to listen to for the best explanations of anything ever? Richard Feynman. If you don't know who Richard Feynman is, you will spend the rest of this year watching videos of Richard Feynman and learning how he speaks and how he, his passion comes out in a rational and poetic way. This is one of the best poetic but true scientific statements ever made because it's true. You are a universe of atoms in, this, in, in, a, in a metaphorical sense. You are made out of a very large number of atoms. And at the same time, the universe is made out of very large clumps of matter just like you. And so that there's an inner world and an outer world that you can explore. I looked up a, a video of him talking about a little story that I'm going to play. And I really want you to internalize this. And I want you to learn a lesson from it and live this lesson out for the rest of your life. Let's hope the sound is work, works well. This is Richard Feynman. All the kids were all walking in little parties with their fathers in the woods. And the next Monday we were playing in a field. And the kid said to me, say, what's that bird? What's the name of, do you know the name of that bird? I said, I have the slightest idea. He said, well, it's a brown throated thrush. He says, your father doesn't teach you anything. <laughs> but my father had already taught me about the names of birds. He once we walked and he says, that's a brown throated thrush. And she says, what's the name of that bird? It's a brown throated thrush. In German, it's called a Friedensflügel. In Chinese, it's called a Timon Tong. In Japanese, a Pahatahara. And so on. And if, when you know all the names in every language of that bird, you know nothing, but absolutely nothing about the bird. And then we would go on and talk about the pecking and the feathers. So I had learned already that names don't constitute knowledge. It's knowing the name of something. 
That's caused me a certain trouble since, because I refuse to learn the name of anything. So when someone comes in and says, uh, you got any explanation for the Fitzcarran experiment? I says, what, what, what's that? He says, you know, that the long lived K meson disintegrates into two pies. Oh, oh, yes, now I know. But I never know the names of things. What he forgot to tell me was that the knowing the names of things is useful if you want to talk to somebody else. <laughs> so you tell them what you're talking about. But the basic principle of knowing about something rather than just knowing its name is something that you stuck to, is it? Yes, of course. It's, you have to learn. These are kind of disciplines in the field of science that you have to learn. That, to know when you know and when you don't know and what it is you know and what it is you don't know. It's, uh, you got to be very careful not to confuse yourself. Right. So, next time somebody uses a fancy word, huh, they may not know anything. Um, there is this idea of, you know, the, the quantity of things, like that number, like 10 or 20 or 30, and, and you might have thought about data visualization, and there's also an aspect of the quality of these quantities. You know, certain things look bigger than other things. Certain things emote the right concept better than other things. I want to show you an example of when it doesn't work and where it, when, when maybe when it works. So this is a real thing. I don't know if it's used in Turkey, but it's a, it's a thing that's used all over the world in a hospital when you want to measure how much pain someone is in. So it's the Wong Baker faces pain rating scale. You're shown this and you pick which one you, know, you are. The thing is, is that is this, is this an appropriate um, visualization of human pain? Yeah. You know, there are other interpretations of some of these faces that I think work much better than pain. Right. So what, what, uh, there's another, there's, there's many of these. This is, this is a, uh, a cartoon created by someone that uh, proposes a 13-level, uh, I think, pain scale, which I think does a much better job in conveying the quality of, of this thing that you would say pain. I don't even know why I'm here, which is like, why, why, why are you asking me if I'm in pain? <laughs> That's six out of 13. Let's keep going. Two series for numbers, I love it, right? When you're in so much pain, you can't even really uh, follow the instructions. That, in terms of the quality of quantity, that does a much better job. Uh, it's very hard to incorporate that in actual data visualization, but I think you should be thinking about it. <clears throat> You'll see why I said this, the bear goes first. So you let's say want to communicate the clim climate change to people. Oh, irrefutable data of melting ice caps and raising temperatures. And after showing you this, of course you feel the urgency of solving this problem, right? Well, not really, uh, because you don't have an emotional response to this unless it's connected to an intellectual awareness of what's going on, and then you draw your own conclusions. But I think this does a better job. You should put that first, and then follow it up with data. Uh, at some point, somebody was showing me their slides, and I sometimes help people fix their slides, and lots of details about the clotting of blood and so on, and then, um, she shows this kid in a wheelchair, and the question is, why is he still in a wheelchair? Why haven't we solved this problem yet? That's a good question, but there's a much better question, which is, why is he on slide 15? Why do I have to wait four, through 14 slides of detail before I see the reason why I should be paying attention to those 14 slides? Always start with the cost of not solving the problem. Never hear this in a presentation. Nobody ever starts, including myself right now, which is ironic, saying, if this isn't solved, these bad things will happen. They just assume that it's worth solving. Uh, here's a, there's a 
down ar around the time of the Zika virus uh, is an image of um, a mosquito, right, sitting on, on a gloved hand, which makes you feel like you're about to be infected, perhaps much more than a really nice artistic representation of the genome of the mosquito, which I love this a lot, but this doesn't bring across the same sense of right, repulsion of the disease as that shot of the mosquito. Um, the statement, this statement, that the HIV genome is much smaller than that of malaria, does that, does that make you feel the quality of that size difference? Not really. I mean, 2,362 is a large number, but it's like, well, I, yeah, I guess. So if this is the genome of malaria, then that's HIV. And I think that that brings across the idea of the sizes of differences. This is a poster I made of the different genomes that kill you. Malaria is on the bottom right. And all the stuff at the top is like Marburg and hemorrhagic fevers. They're absolutely devastating and terrifying. <laughs> and it's ordered by how often it kills you and so on. And there's some information on the poster, such as what the shape looks like when the repeat content is high. So when there's a large number of things that repeat in the genome, which happens all the time. Or, or what does a random genome look like, a random sequence that you would never see in real life? That looks like the stuff on the, on the right. What does real data look like? It looks like the stuff on the left. This is a good trick. If I plug in random data into your visualization and I can't tell the difference from real data, it's a bad visualization. So is beauty objective? Is the concept of attractiveness in the eye of the beholder? Or can we make some statements, not all, but some, about what is more attractive than other things? Yes, I think we can. One of, these is, uh, one of these is my old dog that has since died, and the other one I don't know. In fact, uh, these things are celebrated in books and in exhibits where it's agreed upon that this is bad art. I, I, I think it is. It, it's, it's actually so bad it's good again, you know. Um, and I, I was thinking about this because when this um, $5 bill came out, this is an Australian $5 bill, it was widely recognized as the world's ugliest money. And it was given the uh, moniker clown puke because if a clown vomited, you would get this. So then you have to ask yourself, well, what is the world's most beautiful money? Well, there you go, you're Googling, right? World's most beautiful money. Um, this is beautiful money. Sadly, this isn't actual money. It's just art in the form of money. But hold on, there's gonna be a very exciting part which uh, uh, might make you uh, uh, feel uh, something. If you shine this in, on, in a black light, uh, you get the skeleton of the creature, which is very, very cool. Wouldn't it be great if our money looked like this? Huh, why do we live in a world where the money often looks shitty and there's somebody on the money and they're like looking at you? I don't know. You do want to try to um, allow people to have a way to interact with what you create that's not, that's as serious as they want to be. Because not everybody, not every time, wants to be reading the details. Here's an a installation that wanted to look at differences in genomics, differences in data, and what is the difference you know, in data when some, somebody's sick and, and somebody is well and we get these kinds of cluster plots and we try to figure out why the groups are different and how they are different and figure out what the difference is between health and disease. And, and I try to create an art exhibit based on this. So what would you do? We try to explore different ways of drawing this information. These are some experiments in the process of the design that I had to try, but none of them really appealed to me. This was kind of fun. Then if you color these, you get this kind of fun shapes, but it still doesn't speak about change. It still doesn't, doesn't really make me feel like I did a good job, even when stuff looks really pretty. Uh, it still doesn't make me feel like this is, this is the thing, right? You're still hunting for the solution to this problem, and how are you going to solve it? Um, so what we wound up doing is something very old school, um, and I'll let you watch that. <coughs> 
physical science hinges on understanding and managing variation. What are the differences in the approach differences? And what are the differences should stand out? Things that are important should be salient, they, they jump out at you. In this particular exhibit, they literally do jump out at you. The third picture was used to emphasize the differences between cells in different states as measured by the transcriptome levels. Just as we know that there's no average person in society, there is no real average cell. It's important to be able to find things out about individuals, and only then can you figure out how the group works as a whole. I felt that it would be very important as an exhibit, as a conversation, to emphasize the kinds of differences that we have to understand and struggle with. Because let us not kid ourselves, the reason why we're here is because people are in and we need to make them better. And if we can just find the right projection that gives us the answer to whatever question we're asking, that's always the goal. Right, so there's a lot of technical detail in the generation of these images. And you can overlook it entirely and just enjoy the third dimension. And then, if you want to, you can dive into the technical detail to the extent that you wish. Um, and you can ask questions about it um, and, and have a, a deeper experience. Sometimes you just want to tell stories that are not true because works of fiction, works of uh, new mythology perhaps, are also very powerful in stirring feelings which can then be used to inspire real activity science, whatever solve, problem-solving activities you have in, in life. So every year, March 14th is Pi Day, you know, because 3.14 is March 14th. And I do art um, based on the number Pi. Now, I don't know if you looked at the bottom, all the way to the bottom left you see th six nines. I don't know if you were aware that six nines in Pi come relatively early in the digits, and that's called the Feynman point. Right after Richard Feynman that you just watched a few minutes ago, and I'll leave you to discover why that's called the Feynman point on your own. <clears throat> so one year I thought I wanted to do something like Mondrain's art by taking a, a square and dividing it up into successively into segments that stood after the digits and see what I got. And as you start doing this, um, with more and more <coughs> digits, you start to dividing up the square and you get uh, very different shapes. They kind of look like farm plots, uh, which I thought was pretty appealing. And then you can do some graph methods to color it in a way that doesn't, the co no, no two uh, adjacent regions have the same color, um, and, and create something that is you know, fairly abstract. It's, it's based on a number, but it doesn't necessarily scream that it is based on the number pi to you, and it can stand on its own. Um, and the detail just goes on forever. Uh, last year, um, I wanted to see what would happen if, could, could I come up with a sky map based on the number pi? What if I treated the digits as a sky, star catalog? Could I, could I create a, a, a star chart? Because I, I really love <coughs> astronomy, I love space, cosmology, and I thought this would be a lot of fun. And I would have to learn a bunch of things uh, about projections and about how to manipulate these things. So this is a star chart that looks su surprisingly like the, the, the night sky with the Milky Way, but these dots are put there based on digits in pi. And it doesn't end there because there are constellations in this art piece. And now the question is, and it's something I suffered and struggled with for a month. What should I name the constellations? That is one of these design problems. You get to it and you realize there's a whole bunch of answers to this which are boring. Oh, I could name them after famous mathematicians. I could name them after whatever, right? This is, that's just exactly what you expect. So what would you do? This is not easy. And, and I, it pained me to try to push out a solution. What, why, what I wound up doing is I wound up thinking, well, what are the constellations right now? 
they're these mythological creatures that never existed. Well, there were a lot of creatures that did exist that have gone extinct, to whom we owe our genetic inheritance that we should respect even more than the fake ones. So the constellations are extinct animals and plants, and they all have their mythologies. In this side, there's ducks and birds, and uh, here's a story about Captor, which is kind of sad. They're all sad myths. Uh, here is uh, Megalodon, which has the brightest star in this fake sky, and he is the giant shark. Uh, this is probably one of the most, like the T-Rex underwater. That's, that's this. Uh, here's Rhodosecus, uh, who um, was so scared that uh, he had to leave the water and go on land and grow some legs. Uh, but here's another fish uh, that managed to avoid the shark, and here's the story of that fish. Uh, there is no north star in this sky, but there is a south star, and this uh, giant creature is always swimming down, trying to find that uh, star. Uh, if you look up, you see this flocking constellations. It's a, made purposefully not to connect, so it's a flock of birds that are just flying across the sky, and right at the dome of the sky is the bat, the giant bat, who you always see bats up, you know, up near the ceiling who's trying to get out. And the, 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 the art project is presented in exactly the way that the sky chart, the real sky chart is presented, along with constellation maps, appropriate notation for star names, magnitude, coordinates, and so on. And so as you have a good time with this, you wind up learning a lot about astronomy. You wind up learning a lot about extinct animals and, and species and thinking about um, positively about these things. Um, something more playful, some people, there, some people like pi, but some people like tau, which is two times pi, uh, so 6.28. So this artwork is very straightforward. You can kind of see the cyan. If you had 3D glasses and you used one side of the glasses, you would see pi day, and if you looked on the other side, you would see tau day, and so the poster speaks to both people at the same time. <laughs> Um, you know, if you do get a chance to create something that has a lot of internal connections, um, when people make movies, when people make video games, when people write fiction, they have to build a world that you can step into and uh, enjoy with the characters and find believable. So this project started without me thinking that I was going to build a world, but it just wound up that way. So I ran some code to simulate how snowflakes grow. And I got all these great shapes out of this code. And I thought, the, this, the code is so simple, but the shapes are so beautiful, I can't stop doing this. I made all these snowflakes, and they were just great. This is what happens when a snowflake grows, when you just let it simulate the growth of a snowflake. You just get fantastic patterns. I thought I had to do something with this. I wasn't sure what. In the end, we wound up. Uh, writing um, an article with Scientific American uh, about about the process, and so you know how how do you tell the story of snowflake simulation? Right, snowflake simulation on one hand is is a fairly cut and dry algorithm, numerical algorithm that produces shapes. So how do you make it interesting? You can start with a particular snowflake that you make, and you give it some parameters, and you show the the detail um, that it has inside it. Um, you spend some time, a little bit, talking about how the ice is simulated and how the process of freezing and melting and diffusion is are simulated. Um, you show what happens when you vary those parameters and what, how does that impact the, the shape of the snowflake to, get, to give people an impression that even though there's a small number of parameters, like seven, there's a large diversity of shapes that you can get. And maybe you have seen some snowflakes like that. You can cluster the snowflakes together uh, using the same algorithm used to cluster those cells of the data in one dimension. And then you look at this and you go, that looks kind of like a world. That looks like a map of, of a land, right? And this, this, this TSNE clustering algorithm has this great distinction of making things that look just like a map. So then, okay, this has to be a map, which means this is a world, which means we have to describe this world. How are we going to do that? How am I going to take you on a journey through this world? Well, 
Here is a, a little island, and that's the island where all the little snowflakes are. Remember, these are clustered there based on their similarity of their shapes. Um, so we created a underground tube system, just like the London Underground, um, that took you on a journey across the world. And the names of the stations are generated through a neural network trained on actual tube names in the London Underground. So you get words that sound very London-y, underground-y, and then you place them in this world based on, you think, the, the, the personality of that region. So this is where all the baby snowflakes come from, so all the words are very, very playful. Um, those words in the north, you know, the north is cold and nobody wants to go there, so all of these words look like diseases. And then you draw a map, exactly the kind of map you would see on a tube in, in London, and that shows you all the stations, and it shows you who gets on and who gets off at those stations. Um, and then you step back and say, okay, I wanna get a little bit more technical and show how the parameters of those snowflakes vary across this underground tube station. And then you say, well, I really should hand draw this map because I've spent so much time with these snowflakes that I should draw this and I wanna make it in the style of Lord of the Rings Tolkien maps. So you spend time and then you draw this map of the snowflake land and then you pick names for these places using a neural network trained on real country names. So all of these names are actually generated uh, by a computer based on real country names and they're fantastic names. Huzuland, Kanchar and Pubesha, uh, Morgul organ, that's great. Um, and then at the center is Bunkitan. And right there at the center, there's a snowflake. You see him, he has a name. And that is the first snowflake that you saw right at the beginning. And you say that he's some special snowflake and he lives there and that's kind of the world you built. Um, I'll end it with that. Uh, I hope this has given you some inspiration for how you can tell stories with information, how you can make art with information, how you can respect both how the universe works, uh, and at the same time exercise uh, creativity um, at the same time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.